Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for filling this room up to the walls. I'm Steve Peserv from the Partnership at DrugFree.org. Great to be back up here, and I have a great honor. Uh, you know, they say that you can always tell a New Yorker, but you can't really tell them much. Um, I will tell you without reservation that we New Yorkers have the greatest mayor in America, bar none. And America has a fearless, innovative, relentless, forward-thinking leader on popular issues, on public health issues in Mike Bloomberg. This is really a peerless individual. You know, now I referred to him as a leader, and I think you'll agree that the word leadership tends to get way overused in our culture these days. Everything is leader, everything is leadership. So for a refresher course in leadership, I'd suggest when you get back home, you go out and you try to find somebody who has proven it time and time again in the business world. And then maybe you want to go out and find a person who has done it in the political arena and in public service. Then maybe go out and find someone who's done it through the power of their own personal philanthropy, using their resources to make other people's lives better. Or you can save yourself a whole lot of time and you could look to Mike Bloomberg. Throughout his career, to this very day, Mike Bloomberg has lived and exemplified all of these things. You know him as founder of Bloomberg LP, the world's largest and leading financial news and information company. They have more than 300,000 subscribers, more than 13,000 employees in 185 locations around the world. Bloomberg News is one of the world's leading and most trusted information sources. They have Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg.com, Bloomberg Business. Business Week, the magazine, which Paul Baskerbear is on our board, the president of Bloomberg Business Week. Really just an amazing leader in the business world and an exemplar. Now, as our mayor since 2002, he has done things and, and led to successes I think a lot of hard New Yorkers never would have predicted. Um, hundreds of bold and innovative programs that, at the bottom line, have made New York a better place to work, a better place to live and probably most importantly, a better place to raise a family. I uh, threw this printout over here from the other day. This was in the New York Times last week. It says, I lung New York. And it is the, um, commemorating the 10th anniversary of Smoke Free New York, an initiative that Mayor Bloomberg and the New York City Council transformed our city. We all love Tom Frieden's presentation in the great CDC data, but I think one of the most remarkable numbers that will get thrown out at this conference of remarkable numbers is that since Mayor Bloomberg took office, life expectancy in New York City is now 29 months longer. Wow, that is really, really incredible. Um, Mike Bloomberg's parents instilled to him that one of the things you need to do in this life is give back. And Bloomberg Philanthropy certainly has done that. They have donated to, to worthy causes more than $2.4 billion during their tenure. And last year, he donated $330 million to organizations. Personally, I'm ever going to be thankful for the Bloomberg administration. They took our side when we launched the Medicine Abuse Project back in September at Grand Central Terminal. And uh, Health Commissioner Tom Farley, uh, everyone in the Bloomberg administration has been wonderful. As you know, the partnership's home is New York City, and he has been a leader on this issue in our city, both helping the public understand the behavior of using medicine and, very importantly, getting out to the medical community to help them understand their role in this epidemic and in saving lives. So without any further ado, I give to you the mayor of the great city of New York, Mike Bloomberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Steve. Thank you for that uh, overdone, um, but I loved it. And I love the story about you can tell in New Yorker, but not much. Uh, I will use that. Uh, probably without attribution, I will be shameless and just plagiarize it. Uh, let me start out by saying there's somebody here who is really making a bigger difference in this world than I do and that I've been lucky enough to work with and know for a while, and that is the chairman, uh, Hal Rogers, and his lovely wife, Cynthia, who puts up with him. Um, as the head of the Appropriations Committee in the House, he really has an uh, enormous amount of power to decide what things we have to focus on and what things we don't. And this is a guy who is a doer and understands that 
Uh, we're here to help people, and he's done a great job in his state, but now he's doing it on a national scale, and I just think he deserves a real round of applause for what we've done. It is wonderful to be here. I flew down this morning. Uh, Orlando and New York City are a bit uh, in a uh, friendly competition for the title of America's most popular tourist destination. I will not mention which city won the last two years in a row, uh, but uh, both cities do have a lot to author, uh, offer. Orlando has the Little Mermaid, and we have the Naked Cowboy in New York City. <laughs> Orlando has Lady and the Tramp, and we have Lady Gaga. Uh, we both have famous boardwalks full of colorful characters. Uh, so while uh, it's great to be here, I hope you all get a chance seriously to visit us in New York City. Uh, you'll have a blast, and we can definitely use the tax revenues. Uh, let me uh, commend, uh, for a start, the organizers of this important summit. Um, it is a uh, very important thing. We appreciate everything that people like Hal and uh, all the people that work on this problem are doing. Um, this is work that could not be more important. We have a problem in this country that is growing every day, and uh, many, many Americans don't know about it until it tragically can strike their family. Prescription drug abuse is often thought of as a suburban problem, but the truth is, whether it is in rural Kentucky or a big city like New York, we're all facing the same problem, an omnibus spike in the abuse of prescription painkillers. And Dr. Tom Friedman, Tom, uh, you, aren't you supposed to be in Atlanta working for this? Uh, Tom Frieden, the uh, director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and before that, the person that I appointed to run New York City's health department, and he really deserves an awful lot of the credit for our smoking cessation work. Uh, he has called this a national public health crisis, and I think Tom would agree it's also a public safety crisis as well. And we saw that last week uh, in New York City. Uh, city and federal law enforcement officials made nearly 50 arrests and seized more than 30 weapons as they broke up two major drug rings that had put half a million powerful painkillers on the black market. So this morning, I, what I wanted to do was just briefly sketch in the dimensions of this crisis in New York City and also describe the steps that we have taken there or are about to take to address this particular problem. Fifteen months ago, I appointed an interdisciplinary task force on prescription painkiller abuse. The task force includes representatives from the worlds of public health, health care, and law enforcement. Uh, my experience has always been that in, in both the public and private sectors, uh, there's something that uh, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And so our task force began its work by trying to get a really full, accurate, and clear picture of this problem. And it is a very sobering problem, in fact, when you look at it. Some of you here may have seen a detailed presentation yesterday of the representatives of the, uh, by the representatives of our task force, so I won't repeat it at all. But it's worth repeating that one of the task force's key findings, more than a quarter of a million residents in New York City report either misusing the uh, opioid painkillers that have been described to them, prescribed to them or abusing painkillers that haven't been prescribed to them. In either case, that behavior is a very serious health uh, risk, and uh, the task force found that lots of people are dying because of it. Their report showed that between 2004 and 2010, the number of painkiller-related emergency room visits in our city increased by 143 percent. Between 05 and 11, unintentional overdose deaths involving opioid analgesics in our city increased by 65 percent, even as overall drug overdoses in our city declined. And in fact, during 2011, fatal painkilling overdoses occurred at a rate of more than one every other day. So it's clear that painkillers are causing an awful lot of pain and certainly also an awful lot of deaths. This is, by any definition, truly a crisis, and it's a crisis that's growing, one with both public health and public safety dimensions, as I said. One, not only do pain addiction, does painkiller addiction threaten the health and the safety of those who abuse these drugs, 
It can also produce criminal behavior ranging from Medicaid fraud to holdups at neighborhood pharmacies or other violent crimes. And we've seen these problems all over the country, and New York City, unfortunately, is no exception. In fact, during the past 18 months, there's been a number of drugstore robberies in the New York City region and that have resulted in shooting deaths of store employees and customers of robbery suspects. And in one instance in suburban Long Island, the death of an off-duty federal law, enforcer, uh, law officer who attempted to stop a robbery. At the same time, with felony drug arrests having gone down in New York City, uh, arrests for prescription drug-related offenses has gone up and up sharply. Uh, there clearly are, uh, the this clearly demands aggressive action. And uh, we're trying to attack this on both the public health and the public safety fronts. Let me start with what we're doing in public health care. Uh, our work is based on the recognition that most painkillers that are being misused have been legitimately prescribed, and that makes it even harder to do something about it, although often in doses and for durations and for reasons that aren't justified by good medical practice. This is a big problem, and in the end, it's really up to the doctors and other medical professionals to solve it, and that's why the medical professionals on our task force have developed and distributed guidelines that urge physicians to prescribe these potentially dangerous drugs much more carefully and to recognize that overprescribing them can lead to addiction or even to death. And incidentally, for doctors, they should start paying attention because the legal liabilities, if they are found to have done it knowingly, uh, are severe, and, uh, and, and we're going to focus as a society an awful lot more on trying to go after those who are abusing their uh, position. At the same time, we released the task force report that I just described. We also announced new emergency room guidelines on prescribing opioid painkillers. Uh, these voluntary guidelines have been adopted in all 11 of our city's public hospitals and also in at least eight of our non-public hospitals as well. Such measures are very important because, as most of you know, emergency departments play a critical role in providing pain medication and also in dealing with the effects of painkiller abuse. <clears throat> New York City hospitals have adopted these guidelines and are now posting them prominently in their emergency departments, and we have posters in English and Spanish and Chinese and Russian to tell patients that one of these powerful painkillers can be very dangerous, two, that they should ask for them, uh, they shouldn't ask for them unnecessarily, and three, they should only use them as prescribed by a doctor. The guidelines also clearly state that emergency departments will not prescribe long-acting opioid painkillers such as OxyContin, <coughs> excuse me, OxyContin, and in most cases they will not prescribe more than a three-day supply of opioid painkillers and that they will not refill lost, stolen, or destroyed prescriptions. So. <clears throat> Our task force has also helped strengthen the prescription drug monitoring program. New York State does have a database similar to systems in most other states that collects information about the sale of controlled substances, and that's important because the data helps us focus our law enforcement efforts. For example, the task force looked at data from some 2,100 pharmacies across New York City and found that just 1% of them accounted for a quarter of the highest prescription uh, oxycodone being sold, and that could, that could point to criminal activity. And I think that pattern is exactly what you see in a lot of th things. It is a very small percentage of people that break the law or don't act uh, responsibly. Unfortunately, that very small percentage can do an enormous damage to human life. A year ago, we worked to pass a new state law to make better use of our database, and one result is something our, in our state law which is called ISTOP, I-S-T-O-P, an acronym for Internet System for Tracking Over Prescribing and that's going to go in effect this summer. Uh, it creates new tools to detect and prevent negligent or fraudulent distribution of controlled substances. For instance, doctors and pharmacists will now be able to see a patient's controlled substance history online, and doctors will be required to check the state database before providing, prescribing any controlled substance, and pharmacists will be required to put information into the state database in real time as they dispense controlled substances. And by 2014, under this law, 
All doctors will be required to send prescriptions for controlled substances to pharmacies only via computer with the goal of eliminating the all-too-common forgery or theft of paper prescriptions. So. Uh, these iStop reforms will also give state authorities greater flexibility in sharing information with local public health officials, something that's going to help us uh, detect negligence or deceit in dispensing prescription painkillers. Um, information sharing is also critical to law enforcement. As everybody knows, the city's task force working with state and federal law enforcement officials has created a new and sophisticated system for information sharing across agencies. It's called NYC RxStat, and a name that alludes to New York City's widely imitated ComStat system of tracking co crime patterns in our city. RxStat's activities will include periodic reporting to public health and public safety officials on data and trends that will lead to innovative new ideas in stopping painkiller abuse. And we think also give the public information so that the public can demand that their elected officials don't walk away from this problem. Uh, if Hal Rogers and Mike Bloomberg can face it uh, and try to do something about it, so can the others. And if they uh, don't want to do it uh, or are too lazy to do it, the public can hold their feet to the fire if the public has information, and I think this will do that. Uh, RX activities include uh, the uh, kind of periodic reporting that uh, public safety officials and, uh, will use to spot trends and to come up with innovative new ideas to stop painkiller abuse. Uh, for example, RxStat lets the NYPD use health department data to target education campaigns uh, into communities where prescription drug abuse is most prevalent. And in that same spirit of cross-agency collaboration, detectives from the NYPD are now working with the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration to investigate prescription drug crimes. And that investigation uh, that uh, broke up one of the major pain-killing uh, drug rings uh, that I mentioned earlier in, this, uh, in, in my talk. The NYPD has also launched an innovative initiative to catch and deter drugstore burglaries and holdups by thieves who are going after prescription uh, painkillers. Last month, the first of what we expect will become a large number of our city's approximately 1,800 pharmacies began stocking decoy bottles of oxide content. These bait bottles, as they're called, uh, have been created by the manufacturer of OxyContin, uh, Purdue Pharma, and uh, don't have any pills in them. Them. Uh, instead, very cleverly, they hold small GPS devices that will enable officers to track thieves immediately after robberies or burglaries take place. You know, it's, uh, it, it is getting to be Big Brother, but uh, the Big Brother has a role to play as well in terms of stopping our kids from dying from using painkillers, and uh, we've got to use all the technology that's available to try to stop some of these crazy things. Uh, we have to see, of course, how this whole program pans out, but we think uh, we are optimistic. We think it's very promising, and it's another example of how we're trying to stay ahead of the criminals. And um, if uh, shame on us if we don't try all these things, even sometimes things that don't work. At least we'll know what does work and what doesn't. Over the past 11 years, we've used these types of innovative strategies, and we've driven crime down by more than 30 percent to record lows in New York City. Last year, we had the fewest murders in modern memory. Um, we used to have, uh, 20 years ago, something like 2,300 murders a year. Last year we had 419, and this year we are, after a quarter of the year, we're running 29 percent lower than last year. So uh, we've made a big difference there, and uh, thank you. Uh, Steve talked about uh, life expectancy. It is uh, a little over two years lower than the average across America. It's uh, about three years or higher, I'm sorry, than the average across America. It's about three years higher than it was 10, 11 years ago when we came into office. And one of the things that's making a difference is trying to get things like uh, prescription drugs that shouldn't be in the wrong hands away from kids who would abuse and unfortunately OD on it. 
It's also a function of a much lower murder rate. It's a function of building codes that stop fires and uh, response time for ambulances, which we've focused on, which are at an all-time low. And if you have a stroke, a few seconds really on average can make a big difference. Uh, so we're doing a lot of things. The smoking cessation program, there are 10,000 fewer people dying every year in New York City from smoking. And and we also are starting to focus on something that will be an even bigger killer than smoking someday, and that is obesity, which has become a worldwide problem. It is a problem in the cities, in rural areas, and every place between. This year, for the first time in the history of humanity, more people will die from overeating than from starvation. Just think about that, and it's all come about in the last 20 years. In New York City this year, more people will die from the effects of obesity than from smoking because the smoking deaths have been coming down and obesity is just skyrocketing. And we have to uh, do something about this. Uh, I've always believed that protecting the lives and health of our people is really the first responsibility of any government. After all, if not uh, expanding and improving the quality of life isn't government's job, I don't know what government's job is. Uh, we take our work very seriously. Uh, sometimes people don't like it. I remember when we banned smoking 10 years ago, and I did one of these parades. New York has parades all the time. It's sort of a unique thing to New York. We have three weekends of St. Patrick's Day parades. <laughs> Uh, and this uh, Sunday, I will do the Greek Orthodox parade, which I missed about four years ago. They still have not forgiven me for that. But when we first put the smoking ban in, as you would go by a bar, uh, you got a lot of one-fingered waves. <laughs> Uh, today, uh, we, we did an event um, last week uh, on the 10th anniversary of the smoking cessation in a bar that has been open since 1870 or something like that. And the owner and the bartender for 27 years there and a waitress for 23 years were at our press conference, which we held in the bar. These were three of the most vociferous anti any control on smoking people you've ever heard if you go back 10 years, and today they're 100 percent converted. Their business is better than ever, and they're living longer. Uh, and um, it's I, most big cities in America have now banned smoking in, in bars and restaurants and offices. And when you go into a place that does allow smoking, all of a sudden you start gagging. There was, I'll tell you one quick story. There was a, a governor of an adjoining state who. Um, uh, called me and said, thank you for the smoking ban. You have helped my state more than anybody else. Everybody's going to come from New York City into uh, my state and eat and drink there every night. And three months later, the governor called me and said, I just wanted you to know that I just introduced a bill identical to New York's to try to ban smoking. <laughs> And I said, why? And the governor said, because this, their son had not spent one night in their state since the, the smoking ban went in. So you can make a difference, and uh, I'm just confident that our public health and public safety efforts, uh, in this case, to stop prescription painkillers, are going to make a difference. And uh, the people that are really standing up here, whether it's in Washington or your state attorney general, who I met earlier, who's been helpful, or people that run this organization, uh, they understand that we have an obligation to help each other, and uh, uh, we are making a big difference. So thank you for having me here. I have to go back to New York to earn my dollar a year. And they won't be happy when they find I was out of town, but I'll tell them that you gave me a warm welcome anyways. Thank you. God bless.